Thanks everyone for joining the Equity and Biomedicine Seminar Series this afternoon with us. My name is Alham Sadat. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the Associate Director of Scientific Equity in the IDEA office here at the Broad. We are excited to restart this series building on the work that Murray Kamariza and the EBM Working Group started in 2020. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce my friend and colleague, Nassau Sanat Armstrong. Nassau is currently a professor at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center. Their work focuses on computational uh, and experimental methods to understand genotype phenotype um, mapping, including gene environment interactions. Prior to joining the Hutch, Nassau worked in population and statistical genetics at Stanford uh, to better understand the molecular and cellular basis of complex traits uh, and um, gene environment interactions in cardiometabolic and pulmonary traits. Thank you, NASA, for leading this important discussion here today. Pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Alam, and thank you all so much for being here. I'm really excited to talk about this and looking forward to our discussion and uh, going over a large number of cool topics about how uh, we can improve and increase sexual and gender minority inclusion research. Um, I'm going to be focusing to some degree on uh, gender minority inclusion and in research uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one is that um, I identify as a gender minority, and also, uh, in particular, I think there's a lot of interest in um, the, the overlap between sexual and gender minority communities in, in research settings. And by focusing on gender minorities, we can look at uh, additional concerns that are specific to, to gender minorities. Um, that being said, I think that both of them are relevant, and I'll be talking about um, kind of the whole community uh, throughout the talk. Um, to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about, I'm going to start by discussing who are sexual and gender minority individuals, and then continue on with what experiences sexual and gender minority individuals have, particularly in the academy, and uh, then talk about what types of research inclusion we might strive towards and the ways that we might do that. Um, and then at the end, of course, we'll be having some time for discussion and any questions that you might have uh, if you'd like to uh, bring them up at that time. Um, I'd like to start with a positionality statement. Um, I am white, transgender, endosex, which means that I have uh, uh, sexual, char uh, sexual uh, characteristics that are consistent with um, kind of societal expectations and queer. Um, I grew up in the upper, I grew up upper middle class and educationally privileged in the rural Northeast. And I just started as an assistant professor at Fred Hutchison Cancer Center and University of Washington uh, this past fall. And I'm currently hiring if you're interested in joining me or just collaborating and talking about cool science. Uh, so yes, happy to, um, to continue these discussions in whatever ways you would like uh, after this talk. Um, so I'd like to start by talking a bit about who sexual and gender minority individuals are and uh, some of their experiences. So who are sexual and gender minority individuals? Uh, these are individuals whose relational, mental, and or physical experience falls outside of the stereotypical cisgender heterosexual norm. And these typically include gay, lesbian, asexual, bisexual, transgender, intersex, two-spirit, queer, and many other individuals who hold countless identities and with experiences that either actively or passively transgress societal gender expectations. Um, and it's important to note that like these terms that I've listed here are ones that are often used today, but both the language that we use and also the identities that are represented by the words we use are constantly changing over time and also vary dramatically both in geographical context and cultural context. Um, and I'll be talking a bit about that uh, later on, but I think it's important to note that these terms are not all universally understood, accepted, or uh, consistent over time. And that's an important component of the experiences of, of queer people today. Um, speaking of experiences of sexual and gender minority individuals, I'll use LGBTQ, SGM individuals, and queer uh, individuals somewhat interchangeably throughout the talk. Um, and, uh, and I'd also like to say that I'm going to be using, uh, primarily referring to sexual and gender minority individuals, um, as opposed to trying to reduce individuals to their specific identities, because many people hold identities outside of the, um, the context of, of their queerness. So what are experiences of sexual and gender minority individuals? 
But I'd like to focus here on, on experiences in the academy. And there's actually been quite a bit of work on the ways in which uh, sexual and gender minority individuals experience uh, academic settings. Uh, so for instance, here's a study by the Point Foundation where students were asked uh, their experiences with being treated unfairly by faculty or staff. So they reported on this and you compared individuals who were LGBTQ identified to those who are not. So for individuals who are not LGBTQ identified, um, about 15% of them uh, describe themselves as treated unfairly by faculty members and three and a half percent of them treat as treated unfairly by staff. Meanwhile, among the LGBTQ identified individuals, it was almost twice that number um, or, or more. And so I think it's important to note that these experiences are things that, that people, and there's a large number of other kind of metrics like this in the, in the survey, but essentially uh, LGBTQ individuals uh, experience kind of additional challenges with being treated fairly and also being uh, feeling like their voices are heard and represented in academic settings. Um, this is not only uh, the, the part of, uh, of being a sexual and gender minority in, uh, individual in the academy. There's also potential benefits uh, to it as well. So this is a study that was done uh, where a, an individual was teaching a course and revealed their LGBTQ identity. And this was done uh, for, it was like a very short comment, like an aside comment for about three seconds in the middle of like some random statement about their, uh, about their project. And what they did was they looked at people's uh, responses to a number of different questions. I'm focusing on two of them here over the course of the of the term to see whether or not people thought that they were, um, uh, you know, approachable or connected to their their students or whatever. Um, and so there's a number of questions that they went through. And essentially, regardless of, of the students' identities, uh, this professor revealing their LGBTQ identity uh, individuals were thought the instructor was relatively approachable and connected maybe throughout the beginning part of the, um, of the, the, um, process. And then after that, they were strongly agreeing that, that revealing the LGBTQ identity was super important in both the approachability and the connectedness, um, that, that they felt towards this professor. Uh, and so I think it's important to note that, that individuals are able to, um, uh, to, to reveal these identities, actually use that as a tool for, for increasing uh, approachability and connection in the classroom. Um, it's also important to note that there just aren't that many sexual and gender minorities in the academy uh, or sexual minority identified individuals. Um, and uh, I think that that is hard to quantify these days because people usually don't record a lot of information on this. But um, I did find a survey at Harvard this most recent year. They, they did survey individuals, uh, faculty members, and there was one individual who identified as non-binary out of 1,500 faculty. Um, and so I think that it's just like part of this problem is also just that there's not very much representation. And so as a result of that, it's hard to, um, to achieve uh, kind of like equity and support in the ways that would be ideal. Um, so I think that's uh, one side, and I'm happy to talk more about that uh, in the questions as well. Um, so why is it so challenging to be in academia and hold sexual and minority identities? Well, there's a strong connection uh, historically between uh, eugenics and sexual and gender minority identity. Um, so colonial violence was justified through this eugenics movement, uh, which labeled sexual and gender minority individuals as inferior using scientific rhetoric. Um, and this was overlapping with medically sanctioned violence towards intersex individuals that continues through today. And of course, with many other parts of the eugenics movement that, um, that have targeted individuals with many forms of uh, marginalized identities throughout the, throughout the last few thousand years. Um, this is an example of one way that this has come up in the past uh, for sexual and gender minority individuals. Here's a, a paper by Letitia Frederick in which they, uh, there was a discussion of uh, from eugenics to the new biology, the impact of science on the law's intimate relationship with gays and lesbians. And I'm just gonna read this quote from it because I thought it was particularly appropriate for our community being a research focused community that, fo that, that works on um, uh, a large number of genetics and genomics related issues. Over the same few years, this country has seen a dramatic increase in anti-gay rights legislation. As the Human Genome Initiative and other genetic and hormonal studies go forward at a rate far outpacing the ability of lawmakers and ethicists to formulate policies to evaluate and deal with the new technologies, the possibility increases for state or scientifically identified homosexuals to once again be persecuted. Whether this persecution involves direct oppression, 
such as limitation of basic civil rights, segregation into camps, or even extermination, or instead takes on the more benign form of hormone regulation to predestined sexual behaviors. The threat to a class of people, people who have not yet been deemed people in several states, is great enough to warrant careful attention and thought. Um, this paper has a bunch more stuff in it, um, and uh, and I think it kind of talks about a lot of issues, but I thought it was particularly appropriate, given the reference to the Human Genome Initiative here, uh, to think about how it might be relevant to uh, our experiences. And I was like, looking through the paper, I was like, oh, this is cool. It seems interesting. Like, when was it written? Well, it turns out that this uh, this paper, which um, which I think has a lot of issues that feel very relevant today, um, though some of the concerns that have uh, have been coming up in the last uh, few years have focused more on the rights of, of transgender youth than specifically homosexuals in many ways. Though, of course, there's a lot of overlap and persecution in different forms there. Um, this paper was written in 1993. Uh, and uh, it's part of, I found it on the Digital Transgender Archive. Um, so it's been 30 years and essentially we've made no real progress in understanding how these pieces fit together or what the consequences of this are. Um, and so I think part of what we're looking at here is this history of eugenics and the relationship to these identities has been poorly studied and we need more work on this in order to understand better what the implications are. So what are the implications that we do understand so far? Well, eugenics has made this comment uh, and particularly like eugenic thought believes in the idea of this inherent biological uh, sex. There's a definition of sex as an essential biological binary. And that's really flawed because it ignores the diversity of different sexes that are present in both humans and other species. Uh, and I think it's important to note that this, this concept that there is a biological binary to sex is, is, is simply incorrect. Um, and having this binary uh, and inherent definition of sex is also unnecessary because it doesn't actually help us answer a lot of the important questions that we'd like to understand about sex and harmful to many individuals. So one of the ways it's mentioned harmful is uh, for intersex individuals. This is a business card that was distributed by the Intersex Society of North America in which there's a, there's an indicator here where individuals at birth are, uh, their, their genitalia are measured. And if your, if the measurements, uh, this was at med medical standards when this, um, when this index card was produced, um, and isn't that different today. Um, if you're under, uh, if there's a measurement of under three eighths of an inch, then the individual is declared to be uh, a girl. If the, their genitalia measure over one inch, then they're declared to be a boy. And if uh, anything else is measured, then that's unacceptable and surgery is often indicated uh, in order to correct uh, individuals' bodies to conform to our, our binary sense of sex. Uh, and I think that this is like super problematic in many ways, but, but just indicates one of the ways in which this eugenic thought has pervaded through medicine over the course of the last few years and leads to real productive and, and extremely violent harm to people um, throughout their lives and particularly at early ages. Um, so there's a lot of work on this uh, in the sociological literature. Uh, making sex and the biopolitics of feeling are two good overviews of this, and also happy to like talk more about this uh, in the in the questions as well. Um, in addition to inherent biological, oh yes, uh, I see there's a message in the chat. I'll, I'll be able to answer questions at the end. I want to go through the, the full presentation, but we'll have plenty of time at the end to, to answer questions. So thank you so much. Um, in eugenics and, uh, and biomedical research, uh, there's also this, this conflation of sex and gender. So gender is what we think of as the, the uh, social expectations and behavioral traits that are connected to distinct roles in society. Uh, and that has nothing to do with one's biology other than through social connection uh, and the ways that we've set up our culture. Uh, gender presentation is another component of gender uh, that acts, uh, which is enacting a particular gender role through appearance, tone, and various forms of social connections. Uh, and, uh, and then third is gender identity, which is an internal felt sense of belonging to a particular gender role. And so in addition to having uh, this conflation between sex and gender, there's also multiple different ways in which gender exists and is presented uh, throughout individuals' lives. 
Um, and as a result of this conflation, we actually see a lot of exclusion of individuals from scientific studies on the basis of their sex, gender, or sexuality. And that can either be done explicitly in the case of like recruiting individuals who have particular sexual or gender identities, uh, or uh, individuals who have particular um, kind of sexual uh, experiences, or it can be done implicitly through various forms of recruitment practices or surveys that aren't necessarily inclusive to sexual and gender minority individuals. Um, and this is particularly challenging in the context of family studies uh, and other uh, genetic study designs that assume particular relationships between individuals uh, in, the, um, in the passing of, of genetic material. Uh, and that's relevant for sexual and gender minority individuals, but it's also relevant for adoptees and many other individuals in the population as well. And I just want to note that that is uh, that's something, and, and many of these topics I think are relevant to individuals who are not sexual and gender minority identified, uh, but still um, the, the challenges are, are particularly faced within this community. Um, the last component of this is uh, that sex is uh, is not a binary, and that is part of uh, partially defined by uh, a variety of different factors uh, that are that are connected to um, uh, kind of like the regulation of, of different chemicals within the body. And one of the major ones of those is sex hormones. Uh, the hormonal and endocrinological aspects of sex are very poorly understood. Uh, we don't necessarily know what the consequences of hormones are, and we don't know how they act uh, in different settings. Uh, steroid hormones in particular, uh, so testosterone, estradiol, and, and, and some of uh, these cortisol, um, progesterone, are very, very difficult to measure. And that's because they are quite similar to one another structurally. They're also at very low concentrations. And I think this is one of the barriers, and I'm hoping to work more on developing measures of uh, like measuring steroid hormones better, because part of the problem is we just can't do this as well as we would like. Um, frequently, uh, hormones are just ignored in research questions focused on sex. So you will separate individuals into identified um, uh, either people based on gender identity or uh, based on their self-reported sex or assigned sex at birth. And, um, and those, uh, those measurements are, are often just used as a proxy for one's uh, experience with, uh, with, with both social expectations, but also uh, biological processes uh, that are driven by hormones. And, they're really just like not super representative. And this is true, not just within uh, the context of looking at multiple different individuals, but hormones are also not super consistent within an individual either. Um, this is probably most uh, classically understood in the context of the menstrual cycle where cisgender women and, and other individuals experience um, differences in the levels of estrogen and progesterone over time. Uh, and that happens usually uh, on the on the order of one month uh, timeframes. And this also happens, though, in cisgender men as well, where you have daily rises and fall and the levels of testosterone throughout the day. Uh, and these changes are often happening in many individuals throughout their lives. And it's not something that we necessarily consider or understand. And it's certainly not something that we know all the implications of. And so I think having a better understanding of hormones and looking more and enabling more research on hormones is something that we can do to help separate uh, biological sex and, and make it easier to, to answer questions around what the experiences of, of individuals who are both sexual and gender minority identified and not um, throughout their lives. Um, so all of those are kind of different components of how this stuff might fit together and uh, specific questions around how, how these pieces are uh, have been propagated through eugenics. And I think it's also important to note that not only are, the, are those factors related to biology directly uh, important, but there's also a number of social factors. Um, so for instance, there's ongoing sterilization of transgender intersex people. So many countries in the world um, and many states in the United States require uh, individuals to go, uh, to undergo surgeries that render the, render them no longer able to reproduce. Uh, and in 2016, the UN has explicitly defined this as torture. Um, and I think it's important to, to consider that this is like a process that is often required in order for people to socially transition. Uh, in addition, uh, I previously mentioned family structure issues. Uh, and I think this is a, a concern as well, because oftentimes studies are designed around the nuclear biological family. And family structures and expectations of socialization are based on the idea that you will spend time with your uh, biological family members. And that's not necessarily true, uh, and it's particularly not true in sexual and gender minority communities. 
Um, this is an example of how that might show up. So the Trevor Project um, had, ran a study of, of uh, queer youth and found that uh, around 20, 25 to 40% of individuals, depending on, on their particular identities, um, have um, experienced both past or current housing instability. And uh, I think that indicates the potential of these, um, these uh, nuclear biological families to be particularly uh, non-representative of all of the experiences of, of queer individuals in particular, but it's obviously relevant to, to other communities too. All right, so we have all these pieces of kind of ways in which things have been lacking and potentially ways in which eugenics has been propagated throughout the last few hundred years in order to continue to oppress sexual minority individuals. But there's another side to this as well, which is that even in the context of trying to do work on understanding what these implications are and fighting against this, there's really just not very much money available. Um, so funding for sexual and gender minority related research is really limited. Um, there's actually just very few funding sources available. Um, there's no NIH institute that really focuses on sexual and gender minority identified individuals. Um, and the Office of SGM Research, which is the kind of main hub for that, um, doesn't have direct research funding, though they have been partnering with other institutions at the NIH, and they just released their first general R01 RFA ever on the health and uh, well-being of sexual and minority individuals in October. So hopefully there'll be some exciting projects that come out of that. And, um, and I think that this is like a, definitely a step in the right direction, uh, but it's not nearly enough. Um, and even in uh, research that has been funded for sexual and gender minority individuals, the primary focus areas are almost entirely HIV AIDS, smoking and suicide, all of which are very important components of the experience of living in sexual and gender minority communities. But there's many other chronic health conditions among sexual and gender minority identified individuals and improvements to SGM specific care regimens that could also benefit from additional work. Um, and I think there's kind of some idea that, that, that this will continue to grow. And you'll see that there's some evidence that it has been, but there's not nearly enough money for this. Um, so I just wanted to uh, give you a sense of what this looks like. So this is the, uh, we can look at R01s. Um, this is funding through the NIH reporter website, which you can look at all the grants that have been funded in the past. And uh, if we look at the number of new R01s that have been started in a given year um, versus the which fiscal year we're looking at, um, the color is just which institute was doing the funding. Um, the number of R01s that measure mention transgender individuals has been growing quite a lot. Um, and you can see that it's kind of, you know, expanding. It's still not that many. So it's still fewer than 50 R01s a year are being funded that even mention transgender individuals, but it's certainly an increase. Um, and I think it's important to note here that like this is definitely focused on specific research areas. So I'm just going to go ahead and take this plot and then just remove every grant that mentions HIV. And you can see that the vast majority of studies are actually working on or, or considering HIV as, a, as an important component of their work. And that's because a lot of the R01s that are funded are studies that look at HIV and then recruit individuals from the transgender community uh, as part of that, because transgender individuals have high rates of, of HIV relative to the general population. So that's if we remove HIV, we can do the same thing and remove also uh, suicide related work and substance use related work. And what we end up with is fewer than 15 studies a year, even in 2022, are getting funded to look at, uh, at transgender individuals. Now, that might not seem like very many, but if we consider this in the context of some other identities in the sexual and gender minority community, that's actually pretty good. Uh, this is the plot for intersex individuals. So fewer than 10 studies, fewer than 10 R01s have ever been funded by the NIH that even mention the word intersex in them. Uh, I think this is like <laughs> kind of <laughs> extremely depressing, but it's also just like telling of the fact that like we don't have money to look at this work, which is why nobody's doing it. Uh, and so having more money available to, to focus on and, and answer questions around the experiences of SGM individuals is going to be an important way to, to grow this uh, in the future. Um, and this is, this is among all of, the, um, all of the funding that the NIH does. Um, I wanted to focus specifically on genetic studies because that's relevant to, uh, to my work and to my, the work of many people here today. And uh, this is the number of R01s uh, at the NIH that have mentioned the word GWAS at the, in them at some point. Uh, and this is from 20, 2007 through 2022. You can see that there's a lot uh, of grants that have been funded, you know, 60 to 100 in any given year uh, that mentioned GWAS. 
uh, and there are zero that mention both GWAS and transgender. So nobody has tried to look at genetic uh, studies in the context of transgender individuals, um, which means that we can't access some of the benefits of, of these methods uh, in, uh, in sexual and minority communities or, or gender minority communities. Um, so yes, I think that's, um, that's part of what's going on is we don't have the funding to do a lot of this work. And I think the other part of this is that there's also specific consequences that we have uh, uh, for having this lack of funding in genetic and genomic studies. Um, so for instance, if we look at the GWAS catalog, uh, they're out of this more than 6,000 publications that are available here, none of them mention the word transgender or intersex. Um, nobody's looked at, at genetic factors that are relevant to uh, individuals in these communities. So I think there's a lot of potential work that could be done here. I'm particularly interested in body fat redistribution and the effects that hormones have and that um, and that, that kind of experiences of the sexual and minority community have on distribution of body fat and the consequences of that on cardiovascular disease. Uh, but we don't have the data to look at this. Um, people haven't previously run these studies. And part of the reason why is because nobody's in these studies to begin with. Um, so in the UK Biobank, which is a study of more around 500,000 people, there are only 90 individuals who have recorded gender identity disorder. And because we don't have survey questions, the only people we can access that we have any relevant uh, identity information for are ones who have, uh, who have reported this in their medical record. Um, so this is 0.2% of participants. And of these 90 participants, only 57 have genotypes. So we have fewer than 60 people that we can use for genetic analyses uh, in the first place uh, if we wanted to look at anything that was specific to the community. Um, this situation is similar, uh, but slightly more complicated among intersex individuals where there's multiple different codes uh, based on uh, kind of what their, uh, what their presentation is. Uh, but there's still fewer than 100 total individuals. Um, and then once we have people in these studies, uh, the individuals themselves get removed uh, from studies uh, through quality control measures. Um, so here's an example of the method section of a few different papers. Um, in this paper, individuals were excluded based on inconsistency between reported versus genetic sex uh, in one analysis, and then in another analysis, specifically only cisgender individuals were included. Um, and, uh, and so the specific removal of individuals uh, is often framed as a quality control measure as well. So for instance here, uh, this is looking at genotype data uh, and saying from genotype data that's in this Plink data file format uh, from the sequencing core, uh, the following quality control steps were included, which uh, included both non-concordance between reported gender and genetically determined sex. Uh, so there's some examples of this where people don't uh, necessarily take into account uh, including sexual and gender minority individuals in studies, but there are alternative approaches. Um, so there's one here from a bioarchive paper where they inferred people to be biologically male who did not self-identify as male uh, in the EHR. And then those individuals didn't seem like they had any sort of systematic deviation or mismatch that, that they were related to. And so instead of treating them as, as uh, individuals who should be removed for quality control reasons, instead, um, these individuals were reported as potentially being uh, transgender or gender nonconforming, and then were not uh, removed, but were annotated in the files. Um, and so I think primarily we, we, we see many different approaches to how do we handle transgender and intersex individuals in studies, particularly genetic studies, where we can look at chromosomal sex and use that as a proxy for, um, for, for biological sex characteristics. Uh, but the reality is that these individuals are often still removed as quality control. Uh, and so something like 80% of studies, uh, I'm still trying to quantify this um, through kind of like some uh, bibliometric analysis of the GWAS catalog, uh, but around 80% of studies seem to be excluding participants on the basis of sex chromosome mismatch and or aneuploidy. Uh, and so this removal of individuals is of course uh, a problem because a small number of individuals that are in the studies don't even make it into the analysis. Um, okay. So that's kind of an overview of like what's going on, what the problems are in the field and how it connects to sexual and gender minority identity. Now, the real question that, that we'd like to address here though is like, what can we do about it? Like, what are ways that we can improve things? And I think research inclusion and approaches to research inclusion are an important component of that. Uh, so inclusion is supporting, recognizing and respecting the values, contributions, goals and humanity of another person. Um, and inclusion experienced by individuals, and though it's thus it must inherently be intersectional. Uh, this includes uh, 
other identities uh, from sexual and gender minority identities, including race, ethnicity, class, and disability. Uh, and there's also uh, within SGM community, there's specifically substantial overlap with unhoused, polyamorous, kink, HIV positive, and sex work communities. And so I think it's important to include those other identities and understand the ways to be inclusive among those as well, if you want to uh, be supportive towards SGM individuals too. Um, of course, having all of these different experiences of inclusion uh, are, um, are complicated and there's a, there's a number of legal and international barriers to, um, to uh, including this work. And this is especially present now with continuous legislature being proposed uh, that is directly harmful to, uh, to those SGM communities. Um, and as I mentioned before, I think it's important to uh, avoid using SGM as a noun in order to not reduce people to the identities that they hold because people often hold multiple identities uh, simultaneously. Um, okay, so we have a sense of, of inclusion, the ways that we might want to connect to people and what communities for which this is relevant. Uh, what types of research inclusion are there? Um, so there's intellectual inclusion, which is respecting the ideas, access to knowledge and hierarchy of the academic system. There's scientific inclusion, which is conducting research that actively benefits sexual and gender minority individuals. There's also financial inclusion. Uh, research funding is available for, for relevant work and then making financial access uh, to healthcare and, and other essential resources uh, equitable across individuals. And then there's structural inclusion, uh, which is representation of sexual and gender minority individuals uh, in the academy, and also if access to facilities. Oftentimes, facilities have gendered entrances, like mouse facilities or, or, or other places where essential research is conducted, and to make it so it's very difficult for people to access those, um, as well as general resources like bathrooms and all of that as well. Um, and then social inclusion is also an important component of this. So we can, ex um, oftentimes people feel excluded by these expectations of white cis heteronormativity um, and, uh, and oftentimes uh, violence within the sexual and gender minority community is, is ignored or, or, or dismissed in various ways. Uh, and, uh, and so having an adequate and, and uh, caring responses to, to violence is important too. Um, and of course, there's many other types of inclusion that I think are relevant to research, and I'm sure there are many that I'm missing here. I would love to like hear your thoughts or suggestions on this as well, but uh, hopefully these sorts of things are useful and kind of these represent the ways in which we might want to connect better to SGM community. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit now about what ways we can uh, actually figure out who is uh, identifies as a sexual and gender minority in surveys and then go on to like what the ways we can be inclusive towards those individuals. So if we want to try to figure out who is uh, a sexual and gender minority, we want to serve uh, identified individual, we want to survey these identities in our studies. Um, and one great example of doing this is the PRIDE study. So the PRIDE study has asked a lot of questions because it's a national longitudinal study of LGBTQ identified individuals. They've asked a lot of questions that are very well characterized and, and clear on what sorts of questions are relevant to these communities. Um, and I think it's a great resource. You should totally look at more of their questions and, and kind of the overall design there. And, and I've been partnering with them to answer some questions uh, as well, um, and or at least trying to apply for a grant to. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think that the rest of this is, um, is, is kind of examples of ways that this could be applied to other studies too. Um, so here's four of the questions that they ask around gender identity and sexual orientation. And uh, I'd, I'd like to note specifically that the two major questions, which are what your current gender identity and sexual orientation are, they list a bunch of options and you're allowed to check all that apply, which is important because people often hold multiple identities within the community. Uh, in addition, they talk about your current gender identity, sexual orientation, as well as your sex assigned at birth on your original birth certificate, because all of these are mutable and they're not necessarily constant throughout time. And so being able to represent the ways in which people's identities change is an important way uh, to, to continue this work. Um, and then they have all these questions for each of these different uh, categories. Um, and uh, you can kind of check off different options. There's like 12 or something like that uh, for gender and sexual orientation. Uh, and I want to talk about a few of them because I think they're specifically important uh, in this work. Um, so one is that they use terms that are uh, uh, relevant to and, and applicable to communities uh, outside of the like 
uh, expectations of, of whiteness. And I think that the uh, specific examples here of using two-period, same gender loving uh, and two-spirit as, as a gender and sexual orientation are, are, are particularly uh, clear in that and being able to support uh, these alternative um, kind of uh, uh, identities and support different uh, sexual and gender minority communities around the world is, is really key. Um, in addition, there's kind of questioning as uh, as an identity in case you don't necessarily know how you want to identify, um, uh, but so identify within the community. And then there's also uh, kind of options for other identities as well. So um, you can check off this box and then specify something else if nothing feels like it fits or if you have something that fits in addition to what's shown. Um, and then for the intersex question, you identify as intersex, yes or no, and then they have a fill in the blank of what it means to be intersex for you. Um, okay, so this is all um, kind of ways that you can ask these questions, uh, and I can go through the details I want to like um, uh, kind of cut these off, but I know this is something that's come up in the past and uh, would be happy to like talk more about how these could work together. Uh, but I think it's also important to note that in addition to asking for these identities, there's also specific ways that, that questions are relevant to the community. So for instance, individuals who identify as sexual and gender minorities often use different terminology than uh, than kind of uh, general cisgender population does in, um, in referring to their body. Uh, so one example of this is that uh, they check off, uh, because it's, there's like a questions about both sexual health and uh, kind of screening behavior and practices, uh, you check off like which body parts you have. Um, and one of those is uh, that you, you can indicate that you have a vagina or front genital opening. And so there's a question that shows up if you do check that option, because this is an online survey, they're allowed to change it uh, as you go along. Um, the, the, this question shows up that says like, you have indicated that you currently have a vagina slash front genital opening. In order to customize the rest of this questionnaire, please select the term you'd like us to use to refer to your vagina slash front genital opening. And then you can check off one of the two boxes uh, in order to indicate what terminology you would like. And then that gets populated throughout the rest of the survey. So I think having these electronic surveys where you're able to specifically reference different body parts and change them. And also like there's many other examples of this like pronouns or, or, or other um, kind of like gender markers with respect to people who are related to you in various ways that are super relevant to the SGM community. And I think that this is like a, a really nice opportunity to use these electronic systems to improve the design and inclusion uh, of studies. Um, so that's kind of like an approach for that. Uh, of course, that's also looking just at research questions, and I think there's specifically a lot of stuff that's relevant to this in the clinic as well. Um, so in the context of precision medicine and genetic medicine, of course, one of our goals is to try to take these genetic surveys and questions and actually uh, move them from just being uh, relevant to research to also being relevant to the clinic. And uh, I've been really trying to find work on, and uh, the, the grant that I mentioned that the PRIDE study is, is actually to, to run a survey on what the attitudes are for sexual and gender minority identified individuals towards precision medicine. Like, what is it do we want or, or, or not want uh, in the context of, of this work? What are the goals of, of where we can go? Uh, there hasn't really been much work on this. But fortunately, Maya Sabatello um, published this paper on attitudes uh, in disability community towards precision medicine and separated out non-binary individuals. So the way this works is we have questions here, which are basically asking about different types of precision medicine. So like, would a participant want to receive ancestry information based on their genetics? Would they want to receive copies of their medical records? Would they want to receive information about treatable diseases uh, and the genetic components thereof or untreatable diseases in the genetic? components thereof. And then would you like to look at medical reaction, uh, reaction to specific medicines? And so among these 1,300 total surveyed individuals, uh, around 55% wanted ancestry information based on their genetics, while only 20 to 30% of non-binary individuals did. Uh, there's only 30, but it's still like the um, a, a relatively large sample compared to anything else that I've been able to find. Um, and so if we look at this across the board and all of these different types of categories, non-binary individuals are substantially less, uh, less likely to want uh, precision medicine uh, return of, of information than individuals who are predominantly cisgender men and women. Uh, and typically, the cisgender men and women in this study, 
I didn't put all the numbers here, but effectively are like very similar to one another. So they will be like plus minus 2% on either side. And then the non-binary individuals are much, much lower. Um, and so I think this represents a concern that I have in precision medicine and genetic medicine work, which is if we're not actually, or if we're going to be doing this work, getting this funding to try to make progress, but then nobody actually wants it in the end, what does that mean? And how does that work? And I think it's important to think about the implications, not just of the research study itself, but actually how this is going to fit into the larger society and the ways in which these individuals might or might not benefit from the work uh, on the basis of what they want uh, from their clinical practice um, and talking to people about that. So, um, so that's kind of the limitations. And then what do we do to increase this? Well, we can increase research inclusion in a number of different ways. And I think this is kind of how I'm going to be ending the talk and I can talk more after that. Uh, we, we want to avoid conflating sex and gender with one another. Uh, we want to develop analysis plans that retain SGM participants. We want to design studies with sex and gender diversity in mind. We want to include measurement of hormone levels in the study protocols so that that way we can actually track hormones throughout time. Uh, we want to be able to add questions about sex, gender, and sexuality to surveys and teach using examples of sex and gender diversity, both in humans and other species. Um, we want to acknowledge ongoing and historical violence that has been experienced by the SGM community and encourage funders to support SGM research. Uh, in addition to that, it would be great to ask for and provide pronouns uh, throughout teaching and research settings, engage with community groups to, in order to do um, kind of engaged research around uh, what, what is actually relevant and what people want from, from research settings, uh, and recruit using targeted community outreach so that SGM individuals are not underrepresented as much uh, as they currently are. And then finally, listen to multiply marginalized individuals, for instance, trans, uh, queer and trans people of color who experience my, uh, many of these uh, same concerns, but, but exacerbated by additional marginalized identities. So I think these are all different potential approaches to address some of the concerns that I brought up. Thank you so much. <laughs>